Morning. Morning. So you've told me that I've got Gleason 3 plus 3 prostate cancer. What exactly does that mean? Prostate cancer is scored out of 10. So 10 out of 10 is the worst prostate cancer you can have. And 6 out of 10 is the best. And it's a funny system, but you can't get less than 6 out of 10 if you've got it. And it's quite complicated, but it helps explain why we advise certain treatments. Um, so I'll just explain how that score is made up. So the score out of 10 is actually made up of two scores out of five added together. Um, and those two scores represent the commonest bit of cancer you've got and the second most common bit of cancer you've got in your biopsies. In the score out of five, you can only have three, four or five added to another three, four or five. And that's how you get six, seven, eight, nine or ten by various combinations of these numbers. And your cancer is a 3 plus 3, which is the best prostate cancer you can have, if you, if you have to have it. And the significance of that really is that the Gleason grade 3 prostate cancer tends not to spread. It can do, but it does it much less commonly than grade 4 or grade 5 prostate cancer. So an overall Gleason score of grade 3 plus grade 3 to make 6 is pretty encouraging really and in fact we think of um, Gleason score 6 cancer as one group and everything else is another group it's not equal um, uh, divisions really. Okay so you're saying Gleason 6 is less aggressive than other types of prostate cancer is there anything else in the test results that you have so far which might suggest that perhaps this is a bit more nasty than, than we think? Yeah absolutely so the things we look at is um, how many of of your biopsies were involved. So if all were involved with grade three plus three, that suggests a, lot, a much bigger volume of overall cancer. If there's just one core involved, that's a lot less. Um, the other thing that the pathologists look at is um, when your biopsies come out, they're about two centimeters long and they're about as wide as a pencil lead. So if you imagine magnifying that up for the pathologist to look at, they say, well, how much of this two centimetres was cancerous? And they, they give us estimates on that. So it'd be 5% you know, was cancerous, 50%, 100%. So the more cores you have, um, the slightly worse it is, and the bigger per percentage volume you have, the, s the slightly worse it is. And we also look at um, other features like um, your PSA in relation to your prostate size. So um, all prostate secretes PSA, it's just that when you have cancer it gets into the blood vessels more easily and that's why when you have your blood test it's picked up as a high PSA. So a, a prostate you know, this big um, with a PSA say of 5, we'd be much less worried about than a tiny prostate with a PSA of 5. So these are all sort of factors that we, we look at to think, mm, how, where is this in the, in the 3 plus 3 spectrum? Okay. I mean, being told that about cancer is pretty worrying. I mean, do you not think that we should just treat it regardless? Yeah, that's a good question. Most people with 3 plus 3 cancer, we would, we, put on, we would advise to go on to what's called active surveillance, which is actually not treating the cancer, but keeping a close eye on it. Um, and, and the reason for that is that we know a lot of men die with prostate cancer, but not from it. So you have it and then years later you die of a heart attack or a stroke or old age, something like that. Um, and so in fact if you look at population studies in the UK we know that about 3% of men probably die from prostate cancer. About 10% of men, give or take, have a diagnosis of prostate cancer in their lifetime but go and die of something else. And in, if you do post-mortem studies on let's say 80 year olds and you look at their prostate in really fine detail, look as closely as you can, see can I find any, you'll probably find it in 35-40% of those 80 year olds and clearly not 40% not of your 80 year old mates have prostate cancer. So we know it's a, it's a cancer that exists um, and often it just sits there quietly and uh, doesn't do anything. With active surveillance which we're uh, proposing for you, we will follow your PSA roughly every four months um, for the first year and then six monthly um, after that. Um, some people have also had MRI scans and if, if you're in that group that has, then we would do follow-up MRI scans. 
And if the PSA starts to repeatedly go up and up and up, we go, oh, hang on, what's, what's going on here? This is maybe one of the more active Gleason 6s, or an MRI looking worse. Those will be sort of triggers for us to say, look, mm, maybe now we switch from active surveillance to something a bit more active. When you're saying active surveillance, that doesn't mean I'm never going to have treatment, mm -hmm. sort of deferring it almost. What do, what do you say are the major advantages or disadvantages of active surveillance for me or as a patient? The major advantages are that if we don't do anything more radical to you, which would generally be either surgery or one of the radiotherapy options, um, we, won't, we can't give you side effects of surgery or side effects of radiotherapy. So, and just briefly, though, for surgery, that would be a risk to your erections, so impotence, and a risk of incontinence. Um, and for radiotherapy, that would be rectal um, irritation, really. That there's, there's more to it than that, but those are the big ones. And if we don't give you, if we don't do active treatment, you can't have that. So that's great. The disadvantage is potentially missing the boat, you know, so if we don't do anything, uh, you know, people always worry, well, oh, what, if, what if we missed the boat and we should have jumped in earlier? And that is, is possible, but it's very unlikely. Uh, we, as I say, we do follow you very, very closely. And PSA is quite good at diagnosing prostate cancer, but it's particularly good at monitoring the course of prostate cancer. Um, the, and worldwide, I think if we were to present a 3 plus 3 case at an international meeting with not, not much 3 plus 3 and, and no other great risk factors, um, active surveillance would be the top choice, really. You mentioned you'd follow things up really closely and mm -hmm. do PSA blood tests and if things look like they were moving on, we might change tack and have active treatment. Are there any other scenarios where you think I might be at a higher risk of, of, of needing treatment? Just to go back, the triggers really would be repeatedly rising PSA, maybe a change on the MRI, or sometimes people just, you know, change their own mind and say, look, I don't like this hanging over me, I want to have some, something done. Um, but uh, the other things that would nudge us to being a bit more aggressive uh, would be um, if someone had a very strong family history of prostate cancer, um, we might be a little bit more uneasy about just watching them. Uh, certain ethnic groups, so Afro-Caribbean heritage people, um, tend to have slightly more aggressive cancer like for like, so those would be factors that would nudge us towards doing something. And there are other things, so for example, if someone's waterworks deteriorated, and say you went into retention and you couldn't, you couldn't wee, then we might say, well, actually, look, let's, you know, sort your retention out and your cancer out by doing surgery on your prostate. Does any, any other questions? Yeah, absolutely. Great.